Do you want to go for it? I'm pretty sure people are still going to come in, but that's not going to that's not going to change. Yeah. If you want to get center stage, sure. Hello. Um, I'm just going to take up like a minute of your time. This is not part of the lecture. Don't take any notes on what I'm saying. Um, my name's Georgie, and I'm one of the sabbatical officers in the Students' Association. Um, so I'm just taking a really brief minute to encourage anyone here to stand for the elections that are happening and nominations close a week today. So I'm just kind of doing a bit of a final shout out that anyone, because I think this is all a second year lecture, that anyone can run for any role in the student elections. Um, the sabbatical officer roles are paid full year long. Second years can do them. You can do it in the middle of your degree. If you don't want to run for one of those roles, there's loads of different other things to run for. You could be a program rep. You could be a school rep, one of the liberation officers. We have four liberation officers, which is women's, LGBT+, black and minority ethnic, and disabled students officers. Um, those liberation officers actually get a bit of a stipend of a thousand pounds so that's kind of an added incentive if you're thinking about any of those roles um, but nominations close a week today um, if anyone has any questions there's loads of info on the students association website um, or feel free to pop into Pottero and ask any questions but if you're all politics students definitely encourage you to get involved in the elections and I won't take up any more of your time so thank you and Enjoy the Valentine's Day lecture. Thanks, Georgie. Thank you, Georgie. Hi, and good morning. Um, I can, of course, only encourage you to do this kind of thing, because what would be your career as a politics student without having stood for an election once, right? I mean, that's kind of almost, should be almost part of your education. We should force you to, to, to run in elections once, so you've experienced it um, uh, yourself. So, uh, welcome back. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks since you've seen me. Uh, what we're going to do today is, um, you might have noticed in the structure, oh, by the way, happy Valentine's to all those in relationships. It's all a plot. It's all a plot by the flower industry to all those other ones, okay? Uh, I'm glad that you're here. Uh, what we're going to do today is um, the first lecture in our block of comparing democracies. So you might have noticed this in the lesson plan. Uh, we've started with a couple of intro lectures by me uh, that really just set the stage. And then we had our first really substantive block by Lucy Abbott, where she talked about comparing different regimes. So it wasn't just about democracies. It was about all kinds of regimes. And then we thought, after you've seen the comparative method employed in a variety of contexts by comparing regimes, we thought it would be a good idea to go back to the drawing board with Cora and think about it a little more deeply in how that method works and what we need to look out for when we employ that method. And now, armed with this detailed knowledge of how the comparative uh, method really works, uh, we're going to dive into our two next substantive blocks of the lecture, which are the one is uh, comparing democracies, of which today is the first one. And then we're going to have a second block of lectures that are comparing different public policy areas, such as environmental politics. So that's kind of where we are currently uh, in the lecture. Now, before we dive into the substance of today, and we have quite a bit to go through, let me do a, a couple of uh, logistical things. One is, uh, you might have uh, been notified of this already, but you can nominate your uh, e hopefully excellent and lovely tutors uh, for prizes, uh, which shows them that you care. Uh, and hopefully, you're going to know at least one tutor that's done a good job in really making the course material more applicable and more transparent for you, has helped you understand. And I'd appreciate if you followed the, uh, the link on the PRR news site and thought about whether you might not want to nominate one of your tutors uh, for one of these awards. Secondly, we're going to have a special transatlantic uh, seminar lecture. Uh, it's special because it doesn't happen on a Friday, as you normally are used to. It happens on a Wednesday. And why I'm announcing this today is because it, this is the week after l uh, Creative Learning Week. So everyone's still in the mode of, yay, let's go on a week, one week holiday, or possibly let's finish our assignments. This is really important because this is a guy we don't always get here in Edinburgh. So this is Stephen Erlanger of the New York Times. He's a full-on two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, one of the most eminent uh, journalists of his generation. And he's currently the chief diplomatic correspondent for Europe at the New York Times. What a title. I would like to have that on my business card, chief diplomatic correspondent for Europe. So he's going to have a lot of interesting things to say about a very sort of current topic. 
Uh, and it happens just around the corner at the Edinburgh Center for Carbon Innovation, which is just around the corner from the Pleasants, so really not that far off. So write this down. If you have n nothing else going on, which you shouldn't, on a Wednesday at 5.30, uh, please go to this lecture. Uh, I, I promise you it's going to be interesting and, and stimulating. There's a link down there because I think you have to sign up on Eventbrite uh, to get a ticket, um, but make sure to, to write that down. It's also in the slides for today, though, so you're going to be able to look it up. Okay, then uh, what should be on most people's minds by now is the research briefing. We hopefully have already done uh, a couple of things to give you some more information. I've uploaded the guidance. I've uploaded some samples. You might have already had a tutorial session where we talked about written assignments, one of which is the research briefing, and I've sent out an FAQ because I keep getting the same emails uh, over and over again, which is not a problem, of course. I love replying to emails, but um, I just wanted to make a couple of things a couple of things clear, and the, the main thing I didn't put in the FAQ, maybe, is think about what type of task this is. We're consciously trying, we're, we're forcing you to do things slightly differently than you normally would. So this is not an essay. Uh, this is a doc, you're writing a document that's designed to inform a decision maker. Decision makers aren't interested in reading your sort of two-page, beautifully constructed prose arguments all drawn from the academic literature. They're interested in being informed and being told what might be the right decision here. Or, or they like being told the criteria uh, on, which, uh, on the basis of which they can then make a decision. So uh, one, uh, one good way that one of your uh, uh, student colleagues uh, alerted me to, to think about this is, Think about uh, your boss is going on an airplane, and just before he gets on an airplane, you hand them the, uh, your briefing. So they're going to be offline, they can't do anything else, and by the time they land, they have to make a decision. That's how you should think about your document. So your document should contain the stuff that's important to inform um, their decision. Um, now, I'm assuming you might have already had some chance to talk about these types of things in your tutorials. But does anyone have a very burning question about the research briefing that they would like answered or that they think everyone might benefit from knowing the answer to? Now's the chance. Okay, because I'm not going to reply to your, all your emails on Learning Week, just so you know. Um, okay, so, so I mean, think of, think of your audience when you write this, right? Who you're writing this for, and think about, well, this is not an essay. You're not just supposed to create five pages of text. Uh, but you are preparing a document that forms the basis of a decision. Okay, that's, and, uh, and don't obsess over kind of rebuilding the samples that I've uploaded or making it look just as, I know the one is very pretty, that, you know, the, I think it's for DFID or something, um, with like a letterhead and like nice colors and stuff. You can do that, you don't have to. So don't feel obligated to make everything exactly like the samples. That's why they're samples. Uh, and not templates for you to follow. Okay, if there are questions that you come across while you're writing it, of course, feel free to email or email your tutors, that's also okay. Um, uh, but the main points should be in the guidance, they should be in the samples, and they should be in the FAQ that I send around. Any other questions related to this? Okay, so. Let's dive right into today, because I think today is a very interesting topic, uh, and it's one that is often in the news, but we don't really discuss it all that much in um, political science sometimes, which is kind of weird. And maybe today we're going to get a little idea of why this is weird, because of course this is a topic that is linked to many different, maybe moral, questions um, about the, the right political decision. So we're going to be comparing democracies on the topic of secession and secessionism. So trying to get out, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to first talk about uh, uh, how this happens in democratic states and where this can happen. We're, con we're going to conceptualize the term secession. What does that even mean? Uh, we're going to be talking about what some drivers of secession could be, so what uh, affects uh, secessions and secessionism. And we're going to be looking at two uh, case studies for a little bit uh, of two very prominent movements to achieve secession, which are Catalonia and this right here, Scotland. So, um, firstly, you remember this from Lucy's uh, lecture because I know you talked about state failure in her last lecture, I think three lectures ago, and she also showed you this or very similar map uh, about where states are 
failing or in danger of failing. So let's, uh, the first thing we need to remember is that democracies tend to not fail. So these criteria that we've laid out here in the state failures lecture, in that uh, a failed state might be unable to function as an independent entity, it might not be able to uh, perform basic functions, might not be able to pay people, uh, take the trash away, give you clean water, manage foreign policy, defend itself, and so on, um, or it might not, uh, or the government uh, might only do that for a part of the population, not for everyone. So all of these criteria kind of play into the idea that states can fail, and overall, we tend to see that democracies don't do that. Democracies seem to be better than other forms of states at not having this happen to them. That doesn't, of course, mean that it can't ever happen, or it hasn't ever happened, but democracies tend to be better at that. And maybe today we'll give us a little bit of an answer of why they might be better at this too, why they might be better at staving off state failure uh, or state collapse. So um, if we look around just our own little neighborhood, uh, Europe, we see that uh, while democracies might not fail or might not be overly fragile here, that doesn't mean that democracies can't be challenged from within. So uh, this is a little map, and I'm not entirely sure what the data source is for this, but this map on the left shows you supposedly all the areas of Europe where there is at least some form of a secessionist movement, some movement of people that want to take that region uh, out of its national context and become its own uh, national entity. And you see that this might be more than you might be aware of. Uh, I mean, you can look at regions like, I mean, Spain, what are you doing? <laughs> um, I mean, almost every region of Spain, and I believe this is besides Extremadura, um, almost every region of Spain has some some uh, independence movement. Of course, there it's stronger in some parts than it is in others. We all know that. But I mean, there's lots of other countries that also seem to have these uh, within their national borders. I mean, there's a whole host of um, secessionist movements in mostly in northern uh, Italy. There is some in. I mean, I have to laugh about this a little bit because uh, I am German, and yes, I know that the Bavarians would want to be their own thing. It's not really secessionist movement, but. Then again, if you feed them a couple of beers, I'm sure that they would agree that yes, they should be their own thing. Um, but what you can see is that it's a, it seems to be a very pervasive trend. It seems to be something that happens in almost every advanced Western democracy that you have people that think that their own territory should be its own thing. And of course, this has sometimes led to quite significant conflicts. I mean, we only have to look at places like Northern Ireland uh, or, the, uh, or the Basque country uh, where we've had uh, decades-long uh, campaigns of civil re everything from civil resistance to terrorism. So uh, these are sometimes quite significant. It's not just that there is a bunch of guys or a bunch of um, uh, people that get together and say, yeah, we want to be hashtag free Yorkshire, we want to be our own thing. It's, sometimes these are very, very significant. And, of course, why this is so important and why this is a challenge to democracies is that every state has certain territorial objectives. Every state wants to preserve its own sort of territorial integrity, wants to preserve the t integrity of its people, and it wants to preserve its legitimacy as being the body that uh, rules over that particular territory. So these are quite significant challenges because they go at the core of what a state is supposed to do. And one of the ways in which states react to these types of challenges is through the politics of territorial identity. And we're gonna talk about this uh, in a little bit. So you have all these movements all over Europe that are partially secessionist movements. Sometimes you might also want to think about it as minority nationalism. Remember that secessionism normally is a minority thing. So a minority of the peoples in a territory wants to get out. It wouldn't really be one, I mean, if you have a majority, I don't know if we all kind of decided, you people of Fife, we don't want you anymore in Scotland, you're your own thing now. That's not really a secession because they didn't want that and they're not in the minority. So we talk normally about a, a, a secession when you have a minority that is trying to achieve independence from a larger entity. So this is a pervasive trend all over Europe and by extension also in many other parts of the world. So let's conceptualize this a little bit, what we mean when we say secession. 
So as I just said, secession means very simply that you are attempting to leave an existing nation state or a polity. Uh, so if there is a, I don't know, if there was a sort of an overall movement to split a state up, not just from a minority, but kind of everyone in a, in a particular nation decides like, okay, look, guys, this isn't working anymore, then we would probably more talk about uh, state dissolution. Um, but secessionism means you want to leave a larger political entity. So um, the, the, the most fundamental question that is often in this whole uh, discussion about secessionism is when secession is a moral right. When is it a moral right? When are you allowed, in quotation marks, to secede, and when are you not? And this, of course, is a, is, a, is a hideously difficult question to answer because, of course, you might have uh, very different, very conflicting uh, norms that are crashing into each other here. You have on the one side, of course, the desire of the peoples that want to secede to self-determine their own future, their own actions, their own uh, political ideas. But you have, on the other hand, the norm that a state should be allowed to preserve its territorial integrity, and it shouldn't just fold uh, every time a territorial challenge comes up. And of course, it becomes so difficult because there is no real authority that can give you the moral right to secede. There is no international court of secession where you can go air your grievance against your nation state, and then they decide in favor of you or not. Certainly, we as outsiders can't really give any particular movement the right to secede uh, based on whatever criteria we, we apply to it. So the moral right to secession is one that is often at the very core of what's being discussed, but it's also a conundrum that you can't really solve uh, extremely convincingly because there are very few criteria that you could apply that would, have, that would give you a general catalog of here are the things that need to happen for you to be allowed to secede. So um, we should be, uh, when we think about secession, we should be really thinking about it as a, a, the end point of a process. So oftentimes we see secessions or secessionist movements starting out of situations of armed conflict and war. Obviously, when you have uh, wars of the central government versus some locally based rebels, uh, we oftentimes see a, a parallel movement to also split the territory that these people keep away from uh, the central government, away from the larger nation state to which it previously belonged. But these instances of sort of an armed attempt at achieving independence aren't the only way to go about this, of course. We have the very famous case of the so-called Velvet Revolution in what used to be Czechoslovakia when I was still a kid, um, which was really, which was split up, of course, after the end of the Cold War into what is now Czechia and the Slovak Republic. And this happened entirely on the elite level. There was no popular movement to split up the state. There was no armed conflict. In fact, there was no conflict at all, which is why it's called the Velvet Revolution, right? It's so, it was so smooth, like it was smooth as velvet. Um, so elite negotiations can also sometimes lead to secessions without the need of any conflict, and sometimes even without the need for popular movements that advocate for secession. And then, but normally, whether you come out of a conflict or a, a peaceful uh, elite negotiation, you normally arrive at a point where uh, you have to make a decision. You have to make a decision as the smaller entity, do you really go for independence? And you might have to reach a decision as the larger entity, do you allow this secession to happen or do you try to prevent it through some means? Um, and in a sense, after you've made that decision, um, after both sides have made the decision, that actually is when the really hard part starts, at least historically. It's one thing, of course, to achieve independence from your own central government, to just say, like, look, these are our borders now and you're not coming in. It's a whole nother ballgame to then convince the international community that it should also recognize you. So recognition from your own government is, of course, only the first step. You have to be recognized by the international community as an, as an independent state. You see in the bottom right corner of the slide a map of, of what? 
Can anyone think of what this is about? Which states in the world recognize a certain other state? And you see there's a bit of an odd map, right? This must be pretty contentious because clearly lots of states are recognizing it, but a, a whole host of states aren't. Can anyone venture and a guess what state this could be? Yes? Bennett, okay, that would be, oh, that would be, ah, that almost makes me angry because I should have done that, of course, yes. So that would be a possibility, right? Who recognizes uh, Guadillo? No, is that his name? Guadillo, I can't pronounce it quite, right? So the, the, uh, the current international discussion over whether, uh, uh, which of Venezuela's supposed leaders, uh, leaders is currently being recognized. But in that case, it's more about the leadership of the whole country. It's not about a secessionist movement, right? So this is about a state that has tried to, tried to secede from its mother country. What could this be? Anyone with a guess? Yes, who's that in? Kosovo, okay, brilliant, yes. This is Kosovo. And Kosovo is an interesting case because it's one of the most contentious cases of, of, of international recognition at the moment. There's been, of course, over history, been a couple of cases where international recognition has come uh, rather difficult. Of course, we have some states that are even decades later not universally recognized, Taiwan uh, being one of them, for example. And in this case, this map shows you who recognizes Kosovo, which, of course, has tried to split off from Serbia. Um, and uh, it's been recognized not even by all EU member states. So you see, like, I mean, there's a couple of uh, EU states clearly that support this, uh, support Kosovo, like all the Nordic states, uh, most of Central Europe. But, for example, there's Greece and Spain that have still not uh, uh, internationally recognized Kosovo. So in other words, this, is a long, this can be a long, arduous process. Sometimes it can go quite quickly. South Sudan, for example, was internationally recognized in, in record time, mostly because it was clear that there was an actual agreement in place between the former Sudanese government and the new government of South Sudan, and because the international community had already been involved in negotiations and so on, so that went rather quickly. But when your process isn't quite so managed and when the divorce isn't quite so amicable, then you might run into these types of problems that still, uh, I'm unsure actually how long Kosovo has declared its independence, but it might have been a decade by now. Um, and still, of course, they haven't really been recognized by very large parts of the world. So this is the important step that comes after you've made all the decisions really to, get, to garner international recognition. Now, oftentimes when we talk about secession, we have to make sure that we properly distinguish it from some other terms. Or maybe we think that it's not actually all that different from some other terms that might also sometimes be used. So you might have, of course, heard of the term separatism. I like to not use that. So secession versus separation, right? Separatism has a negative connotation, of course. Kind of goes, no, you, you always want to be your own thing and you shouldn't be allowed to. So separatism isn't really, uh, I mean, it's a term that's used in the literature. I prefer secession simply because it's the more neutral expression to talk about this. Uh, you can, of course, think about secession in terms of gaining independence, which then, on the other hand, has a very positive connotation to it. Uh, you gain independence, you gain the right to uh, self-determine um, your fate. Often, the advocates of secessionism will couch their project not really in terms of this is going to be a secession, but in terms of sovereignty. This is about taking our sovereignty back. Does that sound familiar to anyone, right, from any recent cases, right? This is about state sovereignty. We want to make our own decisions. Uh, no one else should be, no one else, no one elsewhere should be able to tell us what to do. We, we're, we should be the masters of our own course. Um, so sovereignty is often used in that discussion, again, to not use that possibly slightly dirty word of secession. Um, and then, of course, you have a... Uh, when you have public discussions about these types of things, oftentimes the participants that are in favor of secession will couch their, uh, their uh, attempts in the language of a partnership. So it's not really about being separate. No, it's just about taking a bit of control back, but really just entering into a more beautiful partnership together uh, on, an e on an equal footing. And of course, this partnership language you might recognize already from some of the discussions that have been led about Scottish independence. Uh, and you might also recognize this from at least parts of the discussion about Brexit. Don't worry, I'm not going to talk about Brexit at length today. 
But of course, much of the public discussion about Brexit was the idea that Britain was going to leave the EU, but then really enter into negotiations to form a better partnership, better for both sides. So of course, no one really talks about Brexit as a secession from the EU. First off, of course, it can't be a secession because the EU is not a nation state. But still, it's of course a, it's a similar attempt at sort of taking sovereignty back and, uh, uh, and getting out of a previous uh, political context. So um, that said, uh, the text for today I know uh, was really, and I, I, I picked the text for today, the Pavkovich and Radan, because it's such a nice handbook. Like if you ever plan to do a little secession, uh, I suggest that you use that as a handbook because they make that so nice. They outline that so clearly what you have to do and what kind of challenges are ahead of you. And what they also do is they help us understand a little bit uh, what we really need to be properly talking about a secessionist movement. So we could, at the one side, uh, we need a bounded territory within an existing state. That's clear. So it has to be a clearly defined, somewhat clearly defined territory. You can't just go, we're going to secede all the rich parts of Scotland. Okay? It has to be some sort of geographically bound um, territory. You also need a distinct population in there. So you can't just go, I don't know, I'm going to secede with parts of the North Atlantic, and that's now mine. Uh, the, uh, and then once you have a territory and a population within that territory that supposedly wants its independence, then you also need a political movement. So you need a political actor that is uh, attempting to force the issue of independence um, and that says that this particular territory with this particular population should now be its own thing. And then you need to have a uh, attempt at gaining international recognition and acceptance for that declaration of independence. Um, you see on the right, for example, you, the, uh, uh, one of the, I, I love this photo because it's uh, some smart ass put up that sign, uh, South Tyrol is not Italy, right next to the sign saying you're not, you're not entering Italy. Um, and at the bottom you see the Slovenian declaration of independence, um, which again is an interesting little case because um, it really only talks about uh, the decision to establish an independent state. It never uses the word secession. Uh, it doesn't use the word dissolution or any other kind of thing. It's, it's about independence. And this declaration of independence is exactly that uh, fourth step in the process that we need to talk about a proper secession or a proper secessionist movement. So um, where does this right then come from, or the supposed right to secede from a larger state? Well, um, you might, you probably won't, but you might remember from one of the UN lectures in ISEB last term, uh, we talked about all these international treaties and all these international covenants that each codify a particular aspect of human rights. And we have something called the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which has been around for quite some decades. Uh, which includes this interesting passage that says that all peoples have the right of self-determination and by virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. So suddenly we have an international covenant which almost all states have, which lots and lots of states have signed. Certainly, most of the states in Europe that have secessionist movements have signed this. That, sub, that, gives us, that gives a defined peoples the right to self-determine. So that's great. Uh, so there is an international, a basis in international law. Of course, where the problem comes in is in the world peoples. Because who is to say, really, who gets to define that, for example, the Scots are an independent peoples that are not the same as the British. If you think that the British are the people, really, that seek their self-determination by uh, getting together in the British state or the UK, um, then of course you think that uh, all these questions of self-determination have already been settled. It's only when you want to argue that the Scots are distinct peoples that deserve their own right to self-determination that you then have a basis for, uh, for secession or a basis for an independent movement. So as clear as that might seem, yes, this gives you the right to do that, it doesn't really solve a core problem because, of course, there's a few definitional issues in here that this covenant doesn't solve. What is the peoples? And why is your definition of the peoples, uh, of the people, 
uh, a better one than mine, if you are in favor of Scottish independence and I'm not. Now, um, once you've decided that, yes, you want to go for self-determination, you want to go for independence, there's, of course, a few different uh, things along the way that you might try to achieve. Secession or independence oftentimes is not a one-step process. It might have several steps along the, along the way. So you might, for example, simply be content with pushing for uh, more self-government within the existing state. Of course, the current idea of uh, devolution in the UK is exactly that. It is giving more rights to devolved entities within the state uh, that might maybe otherwise uh, seek independence a little more vigorously. So you might be wanting to really self-rule properly, do all your own taxes, have your own defense, well, that's kind of rare, maybe do your own foreign relations and so on. Maybe you're already content with some aspect of shared rule, that, for example, there is a percentage in Parliament that is just automatically reserved for members of Parliament from your region, where previously this wasn't the case. You could, of course, go a step further, and you could ask that the central government, that your state, recognizes you as a distinct entity. Um, and that's not all that, uh, that's not all that uh, common, actually. So as an example, where I come from in Germany, this doesn't exist. There are no laws, this is not in the Constitution that, I don't know, uh, constitutionally codifies Bavarians' inherent right to be their own thing. Uh, there's nothing like that. It's, the, it's, the, uh, it's a unitary state in regards to the people. But you might be pushing for that. You might, be want, uh, you might want your own national distinctiveness to be recognized. And you could do that, I don't know, through money. Who goes on the money? Who goes on the coins? Uh, are you allowed to fly your own flags? Are you doing, um, do you get your own national holidays? And so on. Right? So that could all be a, an aspect of you uh, uh, trying to make good on that idea of self-determination. And then at the very end of that scale, really, of this scale between, well, you just want a little more, a couple more rights, at the end, other end of that scale comes a full-on secessionist movement. You're not content with just being symbolically recognized. You're not content with just having some more rights within the existing state. No, you want to have... Uh, your own government, you want to secede from the country. So there, there is kind of a scale of uh, goals uh, in terms of autonomy, uh, of which secession is only the, uh, the far end. And you can already think about, for example, some of the states you know, or some of the secessionist movements that you know, where they fall on the scale, because not all of them might actually go for the, uh, for the most advanced version of this. So um, oftentimes when secessionism is discussed, we're also talking about nationalism. And this is always a difficult bit because, of course, nationalism is a, uh, is a bit of a tainted uh, ideology at this point. We can't really say wholeheartedly, I couldn't really get in the center of the stage and say, I am an unashamed nationalist. That's not really something you hear much from politicians these days or only from politicians at the very end of the ideological spectrum. But nationalism and secessionism are linked, of course, because uh, the, 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 the right to completely self-determine, of course, is a nationalist doctrine. It is a nationalism is ultimately the idea that you should be able to take care of your nation in any way you want, and no one else should have any say over uh, what you do uh, within your borders. So independent statehood is sort of the ultimate nationalist goal if you're uh, a, a, a nationalist or a secessionist leader. But of course, nationalism is also kind of a broader form of politics, right? It implies a couple of other things that are being done in politics uh, to achieve particular goals. It might be about the politicization of national identity. So it might be you're, you might be weaponizing the idea that you're part of a nation to, in order to support your own political goal. Um, but it's important to realize that nationalism in itself isn't really an ideology because it doesn't really imply that you're doing particular things. You have left-wing nationalism and you have right-wing nationalism. Just the fact that you're a nationalist, just the fact that you want to, that you want to think about the unity between the political system and the supposed nation and its peoples, 
that doesn't say anything about how you organize the economy, how you organize the welfare state, how you do your foreign policy, and so on. So it's not really a, a, very, a very thick ideology. It only becomes a proper ideology when it's uh, supplemented by um, other aspects of political ideology. Like, say, you're a left-wing uh, you're a left-wing nationalist, for example, or you're uh, a right-wing nationalist. So um, we see nationalism at play on many different levels, of course. We can see it at the state level. We can see it at the sub-state level. So state nationalism um, is uh, both, uh, of course, both exists in established states. It also exists in new states. Um, and sort of its central claims are always that there is some sort of national unity that needs to be preserved, and in most cases that you are the protector of that national unity. That uh, in some extreme cases you might even think, for example, that your party or your political movement encapsulates the nation, and is, there's a unity between your movement and the nation and the peoples itself. Um, and of course, out of that idea come a lot of repressive um, come a lot of repressive measures against those that are supposedly not part of that nation, not part of those peoples, or not part of your political movement. Um, and states sometimes employ this nationalism quite deliberately, sometimes to actually counteract secessionist movements. Because of course, one way to argue that a part of your territory shouldn't secede is if you get out and you say, no, we all, we all are part of one nation, one unified body, one people, and that's how it should go. That's really what, what nationalism ultimately is about. Now, on the sub-state level, then, nationalism is often as, uh, associated with secessionist movements, of course, because you make the opposite claim. You are not part of the larger whole. You are not part of that unified state, and you should be your own thing. And uh, so you're challenging the idea that that state that is on top of you is really representing you. You are normally claiming that that state only represents a part of its nation and that you are the part that it doesn't represent. Now, um, the drivers of secession, and you've already uh, heard a couple of ways in which maybe some aspects of uh, how a state deals with you might drive you to secession. We have of course, certain historical junctures where just big empires or big blocks have just sort of gone away. Uh, the most recent one might be the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, which then, of course, led its former uh, constituting states to pursue their own independence. You might have uh, external factors that drive this secession. You might, for example, have external threats to uh, the authority of that nation state. So you might have external actors threatening that state in its capacities, to which as a secessionist you would say, well, you know what, if they can't do the job of protecting us, maybe we need to do this ourselves. Or, of course, you could have processes of European integration, which also have been considered drivers of secessionism, because, of course, it gives you a bit of a safety net, maybe. Uh, you can survive much better in the modern world as a small state if you were maybe also part of the European Union. Makes things much easier. So it might, be, might uh, increase the benefits or the perceived benefits for you to pursue your independence. You could also, of course, have sort of a mix of internal and external uh, uh, factors in that, uh, for example, you, through some through some event, through some means, there could be a diminished, a diminished voice for, your, for you as the secessionist, there could be a diminished voice for your concerns. I don't know, there could be a constitutional challenge and suddenly that nice arrangement that you had your own slice of the seats in the parliament is being challenged and goes away. So suddenly you are in a situation where you don't have a voice anymore. Um, that might drive you to consider secession uh, more seriously. And then, of course, you might also have uh, purely internal factors. You might even have sometimes secession purely as a um, outcome of party competition. You might have one party that is a strong driver for secession and that is basing its electoral success on convincing you that secession is the right idea. Arguably, maybe in Scotland, we're in one of those places where you have a strong electoral force that, of course, has that as one of the cores of their uh, of their own uh, ideology. 
And the Bartkus text, I think, which is in the recommended text, talks a little more about the costs and benefits of secession. So whenever secession is considered, normally the actors will take into consideration some of the costs, some of the benefits, and then based on however they weigh that, how much is it worth to you to have a voice in parliament, that might then drive you to secession or away from it. I'm only doing this rather briefly because, of course, this is part of one of the uh, questions, of course, the, uh, the research briefing tasks, and I don't want to do all your work for you. So um, once we've established that there is grounds for secession, once we've established that there is a movement and that this movement has maybe good reasons or has been driven to uh, really embracing the idea of secession, what do we need to then arrive at a true secession crisis? Well, um, Bartkus points out that we need a few things, and this is, sli this is somewhat parallel to Pavkovich and Radan. Bartkus points out that when we have a territorially concentrated and distinct community, so we need a community that's going for this, that has also already articulated demands for secession, um, then we, all we need is uh, a leader on the one side, so a figure or a movement that really picks up the mantle of secession up here. And what we also, in almost all cases, need is some grounds for discontent. So you have to be, you can't be sort of just comfortable with where you are currently. That wouldn't really drive you towards secession. There has to be a grievance. So once you have a population, you have a movement with a leader, and you have discontent, then you have all the ingredients to possibly have a secessionist crisis or a secession crisis um, with you wanting to go for independence. Now, states can, of course, reply to this in a variety of ways. And in fact, uh, just by looking out Europe, uh, we've already seen a variety of ways how to cope with secessionist demands. You can, of course, do absolutely nothing. You can just ignore it. You can just think like, oh, it'll go away. This is going to play itself out. Uh, people are getting gonna, gonna get tired of this and we, don't, we probably don't need to do anything. Um, you can, of course, actively repress the demand. You can say, no, this is not right. You people need to get off the street and get back to work. This is not a legitimate cause. Uh, you could, if you're worried, either in a PR sense or maybe in a political sense, if you're worried about repression and you're worried about ignoring the demands, you could, of course, try to contain them through, mostly through recognition mostly through symbolic recognition. So you might want to, as a central state, you might want to see how much you can get away with. How much do they want? Let's give them, I don't know, let's have them make their own coins instead of just their own banknotes. Maybe they'll be okay with that. Or, but if all else fails, really, you could, of course, try to, well, why don't you just give in? So the opposite of ignoring it. Maybe you agree that there is grounds for self-determination and you are trying to appease or accommodate the movement that is making these demands. Uh, you could, of course, uh, accommodate political elites. You could integrate them into your own political system. You could, um, uh, I like uh, this expression, because what that really means is you could try to pay people off. Hey, guys, if you don't secede next year, two billion extra for housing, uh, like that kind of strategy might work, right? Uh, if people are... Um, fundamentally slightly corruptible, uh, maybe that will work. So usually a central state will really have a strong incentive to only consider independence as an absolute last resort. This is almost like the stages of grief you go through here as a central state when a secessionist demand has been made. You normally go from ignoring to trying to keep it down to maybe containing it through some symbolic policies to try to accommodate as much as you can and then ultimately when you cannot stand it any longer, only then will you give in to demands for independence. And this might also give us an indication of why this might be prevalent in democracies. Because of course democracies have many different ways and channels in which discontent can be channeled into one of these things. Democracies have many different uh, tools in their arsenal to accommodate societal demands uh, other than say uh, authoritarian states. So um, now for the last five minutes, we're just going to take sort of a brief look at uh, two of the kind of popular uh, European cases. 
for uh, secession that have some similarities, but that also have differences. So of course, here now we're arriving at kind of the comparative, uh, the comparative method uh, as a tool. So we have on the one side Catalonia, and we have on the other side Scotland. We have, of course, important um, similarities. We have, I mean, Catalonia is what's called an autonomous uh, community, which is similar to a devolved state. Uh, they can, up to a point, set their own taxes. They can uh, self-govern to a degree. They have some control over their educational system and so on. So we have sort of a similar starting point, and we also have similar party competition, where you have a part, uh, the, the independent versus union cleavage is really the main sort of political party cleavage. It shows you like a party can't be either or, or they can't not have an opinion on that. They have to stand somewhere on this kind of central uh, electoral issue. Um, you have, of course, slightly different uh, secessionist goals, Although, again, we see some really interesting parallels. Uh, for example, that both Scotland and Catalonia have consistently talked about partnerships with their larger states. Mostly, of course, partnerships meaning not partnership between a junior partner and a senior partner, but partnership on equal terms. Um, but we see especially a difference nowadays, or in the last couple of years, where we've seen kind of this, this idea that Catalonia should self-determine and should be its own kind of national uh, project come under some threat or being challenged by the central government. While this hasn't happened, at least in a formal sense, in the, uh, in the Scottish case, although nowadays we also have cross-cutting issues in Scotland that we're going to talk about in a minute, cross-cutting issues in terms of Scottish independence from the, from the UK versus the UK's independence from the EU. So we have a couple of things in which these, these, are, very, these are very similar. So let's look at them a little bit in, in detail. So in the case of Catalonia, we have uh, a few of the now we've established that, drive, that are drivers, factors that are drivers of secessionism. We have kind of historic claims that this is its own thing. Catalonia is its own unit and it's not just another part of Spain that you drive through. Um, and there have been significant grievances, of course, partially because Catalonia is a very prosperous, prosperous region of Spain. And much like there is also discussion in, in Germany, for example, about Western Germany supporting the supposedly poor Eastern Germany. Uh, the same kind of discussion has happened in Spain with more prosperous regions kind of chafing at the bit at having to maybe support other less prosperous regions. And we have seen, in, in, um, in addition to these grievances, a significant degree of politicization of Spanish national identity. So the central government has really dr uh, made a, a hard drive towards sort of national unity as something that is worth preserving. And of course, there had been agreements between Catalonia and the central government uh, about their autonomous status and the degree to which they can self-determine. but the Spanish Constitutional Court stroke, uh, struck down uh, a lot of the provisions in that agreement. And after this had happened, after the, the, the court had struck this down, we see a skyrocketing amount of support for uh, independence. So once kind of the, this agreement that both the central government and Catalonia had made, um, to the degree to which Catalonia could self-determine, we see a large uh, move towards independence. Uh, we, had a f we had one unofficial referendum and one official referendum, both of which uh, ended up having very, very clear majorities for Catalonia being an independent state, uh, but both also had, maybe surprisingly, fairly low turnout. This might not have felt like that when you see the, uh, the demonstrations on the street, but both referendums barely got over 40% turnout. So lots of people basically just stayed home. It wasn't a question that was important enough to them, which is slightly odd because we always assume that secession is one of the most fundamental things that you can do, uh, that you can do to your state. Um, so uh, a kind of an interesting, um, an interesting dynamic here at play where those that strongly support independence really seem to turn out, while those that don't really support independence seem to tend to stay at home uh, in Catalonia. Um, and of course, we've seen a state response that is very unlike what we would expect uh, here in Scotland, for example. We've seen a state response that 
uh, has actually employed quite a few repressive methods to keep this independence movement under control uh, up to the point where they put a few people in prison and of course put uh, large-scale police and military presence on the street to prevent further uh, demonstrations from happening. One of the main things really that Catalonia was struggling with is that it could not garner support from other EU member states and certainly not from the international community. The EU itself came out and said, look guys, we don't think this is a good idea and we think the Spanish government has a point here and you should, you should not secede. So there wasn't really, if they maybe had immediately found international backing for this project, this might have gone a different way, but the Spanish government was fairly effective at keeping that to a minimum, this recognition of the Catalonian independence uh, effort. So if we compare this to Scotland, and this is going to be, don't worry, the last minute or so of the, uh, of the lecture, if you compare this to Scotland, there's a couple of similarities, but also a couple of differences, of course. We have this same uh, historic distinctiveness uh, of the Scots, but we've also had a very, very, very long sort of political union um, in terms of a few hundred years. And the more important aspect here is that one of the main drivers of secessionism is missing because there hasn't really been any major grievance. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that we can't have a problem with how things are devolved, or that doesn't mean that every uh, Scottish person is perfectly happy to be in the U UK, but the, same amount, the, the, the degree to which there's been large-scale grievances against the central government has been minimal so far, and this is reflected, of course, in the, well, kind of pretty lame-looking curve of support for independence, which always kind of hovers around sort of 30% and really only has gone up significantly in recent years, and we all know the reason for that. So um, I think I'm going to skip this for a second. You can read through this yourself, but there have been, of course, a couple of cases made why independence, why secession might be the right thing to pursue here and why this might be the correct societal proje uh, project to pursue. But the main difference that I want to emphasize here before we close is that, of course, the state response has been completely different from Spain. There's actually been a significant degree of appeasement and accommodation from the central UK government in terms of the Scottish demands. There's been numerous devolution agreements. There's even been this lovely, lovely photo op here uh, where, P where the UK government and the Scottish government agreed that whatever would come out of the independence referendum would be respected, the so-called Edinburgh Agreement. So a much different strategy here in dealing with these secessionist demands. And there's a nice thing on the slide here where the UK government tries to argue that the Scottish referendum is completely different from the Crimean referendum. And they made a little flyer to convince people that yes, this was not, absolutely not the same thing. Uh, we are all doing this completely legitimately and the other, the other guys aren't. But of course, what came out of it was, well, much the same, uh, it may be a similar thing than had happened in Catalonia had you had, uh, had, you had a proper turnout. Because even with 85% turnout, we still had a majority against independence. So, this is about all I want to say on uh, secessionism today. So what you can think about as you, what you, uh, as you go away from here is about a couple of the why questions here that we weren't able to cover in much detail. So you could think about why is secessionism, why does it seem to be a popular thing in democratic states all around Europe? Why have the uh, democratic states been relatively good at accommodating these? Why hasn't Europe imploded in all kinds of different ways? And lastly, why has the central state reacted so differently, do you think, in the Catalonian case?